uh, going on at, at Palantir. Um, quickly with a brief research disclosure. For important disclosures, please see the Morgan Stanley uh, Research Disclosure website at www.morganstanley.com backslash research disclosures. If you have any questions, please reach out to your Morgan Stanley sales representative. So with that out of the way, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Great to be here, thanks. And I think uh, this is an exciting time to be talking about Palantir and talking with Palantir both from, from multiple directions. Um, one, in terms of sort of the product, as I mentioned, I think there's a lot of really exciting stuff you guys have been doing with the product um, that make it. Oh. Hey guys, <clears throat> I don't think there's an actual video. They're just talking right now. Political world right now, all, all kind of come together to make it a, um, a really opportune time to be able to sit down and talk to you. So I really appreciate you coming in. So maybe to start out, just from a kind of high level perspective. Palantir is known as solving like the world's hardest data, uh, data problems. And, um, but unpacking that, I think people underestimate how much is under the hood, if you will. How many components of sort of the data equation that you guys have put together into your platforms and your solution portfolio to get it done. So can you give us a, a bit of an overview on sort of the strategy, vision, and sort of the product behind Palantir? Yeah, over the last 15 years, we've had a maniacal focus on solving these problems in an end-to-end -end way, uh, and we've developed a lot of tech as a consequence of that. So I think the most cynical way to think about Palantir is that it took something as sexy as James Bond to motivate engineers to work on a problem as boring as data integration. Right? And it started with this idea that we were, gonna, we were deeply committed to helping a handful of institutions in the world solve problems around counterterrorism. Right. And when you started engaging with these problems, you realized that the immediately precedent layer of the stack didn't really work. And then as soon as you saw that, you realized that the one before that didn't really work. And that if you were going to be the company we wanted to be, if you were going to have the impact in the world that we aspired to have, you had to take on end-to-end -end ownership of the problem. Right. And having that, that sort of focus over 15 years has, has really meant that we've developed three capabilities that I think are still, we are world class at and there's, there's really no competition for. And the first is that our platforms make the marginal cost of data integration effectively zero. How much time and money is it going to take me to get to the starting line? How long will it take you as the federal government to integrate with each of the 6,000 hospitals in the U.S. to create the first national level of visibility into ICU bed utilization and PP consumption rates? How long will it take you as, a, as an automotive OEM to integrate with your tier one suppliers to have visibility into your cost of quality and cost of warranty? How long will it take you to bring together 400 source systems from the Army to have the first opportunity to see yourself as an institution? Okay. And so by creating software-defined data integration, where essentially the software is writing the data pipelines, not people, we're able to radically transform that, that part of the equation. And wh what I think that means in practice is that our customers can go on offense with data integration. Instead of thinking about it as this albatross around their necks, this kind of cost to manage, you know, what is the least amount of data I can use to, to survive, it, it becomes, you know, it's so cheap and easy to bring it all together. How can I use the fact that I have more disparate data than anyone else to create alpha in the market, whether that's having a better quality program as an airplane manufacturer, or that's having uh, an ecosystem that integrates your information with your customer's information in a way that creates stickiness and transformation. The second major pillar of our product and so, okay, so what do you, that gets you to the starting line. I've integrated all this data. That's really useful. Uh, only if I do something with it to make yeah. a decision. Right? It's, not, it's not inherently valuable unto itself. And so the second pillar of what we do is we make the marginal cost of application development effectively zero. Importantly, it's application. It's not dashboards. This is not read-only insight into some data asset. It's actually about making decisions Making decisions as a blue-collar worker. You know, if you go to any Chrysler factory in North America, you will find Foundry on the, on the factory floor used by every single team leader uh, at, the, at the assembly line to make quality decisions in real time. Right. So having that sort of software that creates a connection between the data scientist and the front line and, and translating that to action. And the third major pillar of what we do is simulation and modeling. The, the buzzword around this is digital twin. But as a consequence, of simply integrating your data into Foundry, you now have a digital twin of your entire enterprise. And th that proved to be extraordinarily valuable in the context of the multiple shocks that were happening throughout COVID and the pandemic. My supplier gave me 50% of what they told me they were gonna give me. What do I do? And by the way, what do I want to do? Is, am I optimizing on margin or revenue or customer satisfaction? And how do, I, how do I ask counterfactual questions of my entire operation? That creates an enormous amount of resiliency and sort of your responsiveness, your ability to seize opportunities in the market. 
And so we bring these things together in a capability that we can deploy in hours. But the, the real focus that we've had over the last 18 months is how do we take this monolithic capability that you know, is uniquely, we built Operation Warp Speed. We got every vaccine distributed in the US and the UK. You know, we did the Afghan evacuation with 22 hours notice. So monolithically, it clearly creates value. But how do we go chop it up and make it highly modular and make it something that helps IT accomplish the reference architecture as opposed to something that's coming up and blowing up their whole world? And then how do we build a sales force around those product innovations and the modularization? And I, I think that's the exciting thing that we saw in 2021 is the quintupling of the U.S. commercial uh, customer count and the incredible growth in the new revenue from new 2021 customers, uh, 53 million, which is pretty substantial relative to our past performance. There. Right. That, that, that's a great transition to the, the next kind of part of the equation that I want to talk to, which is the evolution of, of the, the go-to-market strategy. Um, that monolithic platform solving the, the solution end-to-end, -end, that's how the federal government procures technology, right? They have a problem, they want you to come in and, and, and solve it. And, and um, what we found when we were talking to like, commercial entities is, hey, listen, if I have a $200 million problem, Palantir makes a lot of sense. If I have a $20 million problem, it's hard to fit it into my architecture. And, and one of the things that I, I heard from, from Palantir, particularly on the most recent conference call, and I upgraded the stock on, on the back of it, was um, you're changing that dynamic. It, uh, and you've been seeing it in terms of the product. You've been creating a more modular product on a go-forward basis. But also the go-to-market is yeah. less adversarial with the IT department. We're try not trying to replace. We're trying to augment and help you out with what you're trying to do. That's right. I, I mean, I think, look, we, we've kind of screwed this up historically. I, I'd say we were really focused on creating extraordinarily business value, selling to business users, avoiding IT. Uh, and what right. we've really pivoted the Salesforce to is sell to IT first. I don't even want you to have a business conversation until you understand what is IT trying to accomplish, what is the architecture that they have in place, how, what, what are the modules that we have that we even apply there, and then let's take that knowledge and then go find how we can create business value and bring it together in a way that both sides are really going to like. Yeah. And we're seeing that acceleration in the sales cycle where the monolithic sale could happen really fast in the context of a crisis. But absent that, you might be talking about you know, a year or longer. And with a modular approach, the product that we have around HyperAuto, that's the software-defined data integration for ERP products, it's a three-month sales cycle. It's a one-day pilot. Uh, it's a price point IT can make a unilateral local decision on. Right. And, it, and it creates an upsell motion for us. It, it, it is the land that allows us to then expand as we go to the business, we solve more problems, we're already part of the blessed architecture, and it's a win for everyone. Right, and, and I think there's some also a synergy between sort of product development and sort of the, the trying to help out IT more with some of the projects like Apollo, right, um, of where you're trying to make um, the IT department's life easier and, and more efficient and, and more uh, price effective. Can you talk about Apollo and why that's yeah. important? Yeah, so we, we, we talked about Apollo around the listing as really this kind of third platform that we had built for ourselves. It's our continuous delivery infrastructure and so much more, really our platform engineering and production infrastructure capability. Mm -hmm. And what it's allowed us to do is to deploy our product as SaaS environments that you typically don't have market access to SaaS for. So on-premise Swiss banks, where there, you know, it just needs to be on-premise in Switzerland or uh, into e exotic edge environments on the factory floor where there is no cloud given the data scale and the cost of dealing with the cloud, or more, more exquisite environments like at the edge of a, of a car in an automotive OEM context. Right. So how are you going to manage your software in all these contexts where you don't just have a small number of public multi-tenant cloud instances without giving up all your margin? Right. And, and, and Apollo allows us to automate that. So our, our engineers write code once. That code is securely deployed. Um, it has automated uh, service level obligation adjudication to know that the software you're delivering is actually a, at least a performance improvement or not a degradation and automatically adjudicates that, those factors, has built in security. So when you have a, a vulnerability in, in, a, in a code package, it automatically blacklists that package and rolls back to a prior good known version or patches forward with new releases. And it's integrated, it has a, a software supply chain capability. So with it's integrated with how you write code. Each of your code commits are actually signed with the hardware token. So I know that Keith committed this code right. and not a Russian hacker spoofing Keith trying to get a back door into our software. And I think we're less than a year away from a world where the U.S. government requires all vendors who, who sell software to the government um, to, to have an audited software supply chain, right. um, given the amount of risk we've seen between Log4j and, and SolarWinds around that. So right. we would love to bring, you know, this tooling has been transformative for us. We also think, to your earlier point about geopolitics, the world is getting more fractured here. You know, the, the UK is no longer part of the EU. If, if you want to really go after market access, you're going to have to have 
many environments specific to the markets you're in that are running your latest and greatest code right. and that don't overly burden you as a company. And so making our customers' lives easier as they're writing first-party software is a big part of the Apollo vision. Got it. So as we talked a little bit about sort of the, the product and modularization, can you talk to us about where we are in ramping up the sales force? Because you, you need people on the ground to go out and be able to sell this. Um, what were you able to accomplish in, in, in 2021? Sort of what's the goal um, uh, into 2022 in terms of getting that, that, that commercial field to sales force? Our, our real focus over the last 18 months has been, can we get it to work really well in one place, the yeah. U.S.? Yeah. Right? And so uh, we, we hired uh, about 80, we exited the year with about 80 folks. We started the year with 12 folks in the U.S. commercial business. We exited with about 80 folks, of which 25 have been here uh, nine months or longer. But what we're excited about, the work over those 18 months was coming up with the modules, ensuring the modules had the right sort of product market fit, right. uh, the ability to figure out the buyer personas, uh, to drive that into the sales force, where we have the sales force organized both by accounts, and the accounts they're covering, their job is to be an expert in the customer, and by these horizontal overlays, the modules essentially. So how do they go and meet in the market between these two things? So I, I think the result, what we've really been able to show is that we can drive down the cycle time on, on these relationships. We can, we can nail a land motion that's driving to expand. Right. Uh, we can meet the customer where they need to be on price and still have a way of capturing value over time. And so we've still, we hit the ground hunting, running very hard this year building out the same sales force, uh, same approach in Europe, uh, and continuing to hire at the same pace in, in the U.S. Got it. I, I want to touch on one of the more kind of controversial parts of, of the commercial business, which is your strategic investment uh, portfolio. Um, I think you've done nearly $400 million in strategic investments this year, um, and uh, a lot through SPACs, and, and those strategic investments contributing nearly $50 million in revenues. And it's trying to understand sort of the vision and the philosophy behind that. And it, from a, a high level of view, it doesn't seem too different from when we hear snowflake ventures and they want to sort of invest in early stage companies to build upon their platform. Or I was talking to Databricks today and they have a, a similar kind of initiative going forward. Is that the similar ilk in terms of what you guys are trying to do with these strategic investments? Yeah, let's talk about what is strategic about the strategic investment program. And so I, I think the, the business, the, the, the aspiration, like what is the highest potential use of Foundry? And I think it's application development infrastructure. It, it should be okay. where you go to build the applications of the future, not AWS, not Azure. Like these things are great and they're fine and they work, but they're, they're rather highly un, unopinionated. If you're going to go build something like Skywise, which is the aviation ecosystem that Airbus built on top of Foundry, it, it has 160 airlines that run their operations on this software. Uh, it, it's integrated with their top 15 suppliers, and it generates over $3 billion worth of value for them a year. You know, we started working on, on Skywise two years after Boeing and Microsoft announced their own aviation ecosystem, which is nowhere. Right. And then it's not because Microsoft's tech doesn't work. It does work. It's because most of the hard work is in front of you. You know, just saying that you're going to use this storage and this compute is not how you get to value. It, there's so much risk and execution that's left for these companies. So what's strategic about it is, like, we have invested so much opinion. If you are building applications that require you to integrate disparate data to generate, like, business logic and, and decision-making interfaces for normal human beings, I don't know how you could do better than starting and building on top of Foundry there. Okay. And so I am so excited to work with all my customers who have supply chain problems or want to work on pricing or integration in production, but that's not the strategic investment program. Okay. That, the strategic part of this is Foundry is our AWS. Right. And, and finding that, it really pushes us in both ways. Like we, we have accomplished so much in terms of what our product can do in that category. We've also been able to, to partner with companies to bring the cutting edge uh, technology we first created in government around edge AI and bring that to the commercial world. There, there's clearly, if, if you're building autonomous vehicles, you're generating about 10 terabytes of data an hour on the vehicle. Right. It is completely cost prohibitive to bring all that data to the cloud. So you need to do the AI edge inferencing, the data analytics at the edge. And so being able to have the right sort of partnerships to transition that and expand the surface area of what our platforms do is incredibly valuable. Got it. I, on a go-forward basis, should investors think about, or will, should investors expect a similar kind of level of strategic investment on, on a go-forward basis in those programs? Uh, I think we're still going to do strategic things. I, I'm not, like, the SPAC market doesn't exist anymore. It, it, it's going to manifest in different ways and won't right. always involve putting capital to work in quite the same way. Right. But, like, we're deeply committed to being the infrastructure that people build their business on top right. of. Uh, and it, that will manifest in many ways. So I think you should expect the SPAC program to basically peak now. There, right. Of the 30 customers, 30-some-odd 30 customers we added in Q4, zero were SPACs. Right. 
Got it, got it, got it. That's helpful. Um, last thing I want to touch on the commercial side of the equation is um, evolution in kind of the pricing model and how, how you guys are thinking about that with the increasing modularity and also sort of the evolving kind of use cases that you guys are bringing up. Um, can you talk to us about sort of where pricing was 18, 24 months? So not much said on SPACs. Evolution there. So historically, like 18 months ago, there's really only two ways that you could think about licensing something like Foundry. Uh, an enterprise license, that's all you can eat, and, right. and rather expensive. Uh, or you could license it per use case, a kind of ring fence where the aspiration was really after two or three use cases, you would aspire to have an enterprise license. Right. Uh, and so that created a lot of barriers to entry, obviously. So the, the big thing we've been working on is consumption-based pricing that allows folks to start with essentially no commit, start where they, they want to start on problems that, that they're scoping to, uh, and then slowly over time consume more and more, and we're rewarded for the consumption that they have, for the value they're getting out of the product. Uh, it motivates to us to, in, to invest in those capabilities. It also allows us to activate the partner ecosystem in a way that we really couldn't before with use case-based pricing. Right. Got it. I'm a big fan of consumption-based pricing. You just, uh, really good sort of, it, 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 from my perspective, it, it kind of solves the original sin of software of, of um, selling something that they're not using, right, and, yeah. and, and shelfware. Um, and you don't get paid until the customer starts to see value. Um, what, what should, how should investors think about the, the ramp there? Like, it, 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 not really a big part of sort of revenues today. Um, what's the expectation of sort of how, how, how quickly that can ramp within that, that commercial business? Yeah, I think it's too soon to give like something concrete on the ramp there, but like we're in the market. Now we've closed usage-based pricing deals really starting this quarter, Q1. Uh, and so I think you'll start to see it later and expect some commentary from us okay. as that starts to happen. Got it. I, I'd love your opinion on sort of the, uh, one of the big investor baits that have kind of come up over the last two weeks. Um, post snowflake, right, is um, within these consumption models, uh, price performance improvements that you see from sort of getting your um, underlying platform to be more efficient and more effective on a going forward basis, should that be passed through to the end customer or should like the vendor kind of accrue that in margin and, and see the benefit uh, today? How, how do you guys think about those price performance improvements and, and sort of whether that's important to pass on to the customer? If you're building the company for the long term, I think there's no doubt that you want to continuously invest in price performance improvements. Right. You're going to be able to expand the number of workloads. You're going to kind of go from the highest and most exotic, hardest problems to the, the preponderance of the enterprise, almost to the point where you've hit everything that's kind of banal. And there are real network effects in, in, the, in, in the software, or to the extent you are a company with real network effects in your software, you want to maximize the adoption that you can really have. And that, that creates a kind of deeper gravity well what you're doing. And I think you have to be really thoughtful about that because it's just clear that cloud deflation has to come. Unless there's only going to be three companies left in the world. The revenue can't keep growing more slowly for your customers than their cloud bills. Right. And so if you're not investing in cloud deflation, and, and by the way, when you're, when you're trying to deal with this price performance, there is no overnight solve for, the, for that. that. That's right. a lot of engineering work. It's, it's real effort. And so if you're thinking about how am I going to continue growing my relationship with this customer over the next five, ten years, I think it's crucial. Yeah, excellent. Um, I agree. Um, I want to switch gears to the government business. Um, the, the, the government side of the equation is, is one that I've always been um, very optimistic about and, and um, uh, very positive on. And I think um, to a certain extent, I think investors um, overlook your positioning there, right? Um, can you talk to, to us about um, it, it, almost like the concept of lighthouse accounts and how that occurs in the federal government, particularly the, the, the U.S. federal government, and sort of the permission it gives you to sort of spread out into additional agencies and do more. Yeah, you have this interesting dynamic in, in government where, you know, you know, I think in the commercial world, largely it's all competitive. Yes. You know, in, in government, these agencies are kind of, because naturally as humans we're competitive, but they're fundamentally cooperative as well. Uh, and so if you, you have immense network effects as a result. Uh, and so when we are able to solve some of these very hard problems in, in, under incredible timelines, it sets the standard for what is the requirement that the acquisition executives across services, across different agencies, even if we've done this project in one place, are going to be converging on and going after. Uh, so I think it plays to a lot of our strengths and our ability to invest outside of the government's um, own expectation or vision of what can be done. And, 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 you know, I think we seize those opportunities really well. If you look at how much product that we've created since the listing, we have our edge AI capability, which did not exist at the listing. That's going to be launched into a hardware bus of a satellite this month in space. 
uh, the, the work that we've done with Meta Constellation, we were really, you know, obviously we had no knowledge of what's going on in Ukraine, but it is being used in anger by multiple Western allied services to really observe and take space from an intelligence domain where you're looking at what's happening every week to how can I use this in a real-time decision-making sort of basis? How do I pair the imagery I'm getting from space with my AI models to drive my common operating picture? How does that feed into Gotham uh, in terms of how I'm then running operations? Uh, so it, it's been really exciting to see that. And, and we've also seen a lot of acceleration uh, based on these sorts of exigent events. The work that we did with CD2, I mean, that, that army program was designed for a land war with Russia. Okay. You know, and uh, when the moment came, it, it, was, it was ready to be used. Like, okay, where can these, where can these tanks go? What's the restricted train what, based on the elevation? What, what's navigable? How long will it take them to get there? How do we help plan around these things? And, and, and really, you know, in so many different dimensions, we were there to meet the moment, and, that, and that's really exciting. It, it's obviously exciting from a mission perspective. It's, it's what we get up and, and are excited about working on as engineers, but it catalyzes the growth of the business. It, it creates, it doesn't show up in a quarter, right. but it creates all these tentacles. It, it defines what good looks like, whether you're the Air Force or the Army or the Marines, right. and it starts informing the acquisition philosophy. And in our case, this is commercial product that exists. It's not something right. you have to go build two years from now. You could get it tomorrow. Right. Got it. So. Uh, on, on the government side of the business, I think one of the reasons that um, investors perhaps underestimated and, and, and perhaps ignored is it's so complicated to understand um, how the government sources, sort of um, how the funds start to flow through. I want to kind of rewind the clock a little bit and, and, and start back in 2018 when you guys won a, a court decision that really opened up a lot of these federal opportunities to you. One, let's start there, just like, why was that so important and what's been the follow through? Like, how, how good of a follow through have you seen on sort of that initial kind of entry point? Yeah, so the court decision was really based around, you can think about it as build or buy. Yeah. And you may remember, I think it was in the 90s, there was this issue where we were buying like $700 toilet seats yeah. instead of going to Home Depot. Uh, and and the, the basically the, the law was you need to buy things that exist uh, and, you need, and to the extent you have really ex exotic requirements, you first need to see if you can change your requirement to buy things that exist rather than custom building it. Right. Um, and, and as you can imagine, with the incumbents in, in government, there's no interest in them enforcing that. That's against their business model. Right. And so having some teeth around that was very helpful. It, it also coincides with the time where the department and the government more broadly wants to transform. They can't keep affording to spend as much. They can't have things take as long. There's an interest in bringing the kind of greater power and innovation of America to bear on these problems and finding non-traditionals. And that, that is as important of, of the acceleration that we've seen on the back of that. And that's created a lot of new opportunities where we can start, you know, I would say some, something like Space Force, we started at 100K a couple of years ago and, and now it's $24 million a year and, and growing. You have this opportunity where they, they really view what we've done, they call it Warp Core, as a software factory. This, right. this vision of Foundry as, as infrastructure to build applications on top of, it's where they go to build their own applications that drive their dominance in, in space. Right. Uh, and so having these Lighthouse customers then reflects on how other agencies and organizations can, can adopt the same thing. And I think we, the whole world has changed. You know, Europe is not the same place it was two years ago. Right. Uh, the sort of, to the degree that some of those militaries were kind of performative, uh, they're not going to be performative going forward. You right. see that with the Germans committing 100 billion euro uh, to, to modernizing their force because they realize the threats are real. And I think that's also going to create a lot of market access not just because they need it, but they also are going to need it in the context of collaborating with allied forces. Right. You're jumping ahead to part three of my question, but um, part two of the question before we get there. So government business in 2018 unlocks, and, you're doing, and, and the growth rates are, are extraordinary. Continuing resolutions hit, right? And can you explain to us sort of what that means from like a Palantir uh, side of the equation. You have the existing contracts. Um, what is that um, sort of, what's the impact in terms of being able to get new contracts rolling versus executing on existing contracts? Yeah. And the what kind of drag does that exert? The, the principal drag that these continuing resolutions dra uh, create is that they prevent new starts from yeah. occurring. So existing programs can continue, things that have been budgeted for more or less can continue, but things that are new, new awards, uh, they get delayed until this happens. Right. Now I think there, there's also, there's really complicated dynamics that happen when a budget does get passed. So if we get a budget imminently here, that whole money needs to be spent by September 30th. Yeah. And in reality, you, you can't spend money on September 30th. You have, so that means everything has to more or less be obligated in July. Yeah. So you have from April to July to go spend an entire year's worth of funding. 
Uh, and so that creates volatility to the upside where lots of projects um, are going to get additional capital to go even faster. Right. So those projects can be shaped by real-world events. Uh, and other projects may kind of get caught up in uh, the sort of blitz to get the money out the door. Got it. And then part three, then there's exogenous events, and you have a, a, a geopolitical crisis like Ukraine. Um, if emergency uh, spending bills start getting passed. How does that change the dynamic? Does that free up spending and, 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 and free up dollars that could be put at use for, for solutions like Palantir? It, it absolutely does, and I think it plays to the strength of our business model where you know, we're not waiting for that money to be obligated to start innovating. Like we are there literally on the front lines building as much features as we can for the generals who are running these campaigns, right. creating as much visibility across the allied force. That, that innovation, it's like a punctuated equilibrium, and it creates a bunch of IP, a bunch of interesting products that then can be uh, systematized and brought to bear against the government's problems through the funding that, that is available. Got it, got it. That sounds very bullish to me. Um, <laughs> from well, what I, I, so the thing I'm most excited about in the government is I think we have the opportunity to be the first software prime. You, depending on how you count it, you, there, yeah. there's you know, four to five primes. They're principally yeah. hardware companies. Yeah. Uh, but with, with Titan, this project that we've taken on to build a tactical ground station, we are the prime contractor as a software company. Yeah. We're using that unique position to understand how do we totally transform this asset, which you know, connects the space uh, constellations from the ground using software to, to fundamentally reimagine this. It's a little bit like what Tesla did to the car. Sure. And I think that's going to create profound opportunities uh, in the government space. Yeah. I don't think there's much debate that you guys get to work on the coolest shit. Um, I wanted to, an uncool part of the equation. Let's talk about margins a little bit. Um, operating margins had a tremendous expansion um, ahead of the listing, through the listing, uh, into, into 2021. For 2022, you are looking for operating margins to come in a little bit. And investors are kind of un- trying to understand the shape of that curve, right? So um, it, it's, it's, it's not 30% in the near term. Is it in the long term? Is 27% at the bottom? Like, how should we think about where those operating margins level out and maybe trend to over time? Yeah, I mean, 21 shows you know high growth and high free cash flow, and that's that's what we're doing, and that's what we think we're going to keep doing here. Right. And so we uh, we're giving ourselves some space as we invest. We we saw incredible movement on the margin just given the the, the investments in the product and how they paid off, and, and, and frankly, they, they 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 drove more improvement faster than we we actually thought they might. Right. And now we're investing significantly in the go-to-market. Uh, we're giving our, ourselves a little space there to to invest as aggressively as possible. But I, I think we're we're in a range. I wouldn't expect it to deviate too much. Okay, got it. So stable margins on a go-forward basis. So in the 36 seconds we have left, um, any questions from the audience? Outstanding. So uh, maybe just to um, leave on, on kind of one uh, uh, last question from for me. Um, and I think you touched on this a little bit. When we think about, we talked a lot about sort of the, the product innovations on the commercial side of the equation around Apollo and Foundry. Um, What's most exciting in terms of what in the evolution of Gotham on a go-forward basis on the federal side of the business? Well, I mean, Gotham has taken so much surface area in terms of operation. So, yeah. you know, Gotham used to be used in anger every single night on counterterrorism operations. And as the, the U.S. and our focus as the West has pivoted to near-peer adversaries, uh, to Russia, to China, and, and seeing these things, the innovation has really been on integrating on the, in, the entire suite of sensor and shooter capabilities from space to mud. So how do we better leverage space? How do we bring it to these domains? How do we AI enable that so it's helping commanders make decisions, not just understand what's going on, but understanding what they can do about what's going on there? And that, that's, that it, it is the single pane of data that creates the single pane of glass to run your operations on. You see that with Meta Constellation bringing right. space in. You see that with Edge AI. Like, how do I push that inferencing to the edge? How, how do these things operate in survivable, disconnected modes? How do we bring it? How do we kind of upgrade all of the hardware we do have to be AI enabled? Right. Outstanding. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a super interesting conversation and very exciting to see the evolution of Palantir continue. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Okay, that uh, was interesting. It looks like it was really just pre-recorded in advance because I did have a question and uh, 
yeah he did they they didn't answer it so i think it was uh definitely played in advance uh or recorded in advance i, I suppose uh, or they just totally dodged my question i have no idea but uh yeah to your point uh drew the net uh retention for the customers i remember looking at it in the company remarks for uh, q4 2021 and i remember seeing it right somewhere around here so let me make my uh, oh actually i just realized i should make my thing a bit smaller okay cool so Okay, so U.S. commercial net dollar retention was 150%. So, I mean, this clearly is, they're killing it, right? They doubled their revenues, went from 48 to 99 to 200. So, it's been like 100% growth every year. And we can't forget, you know, that was always done with a very small headcount team. I think it was, uh, what, what did they say it was? 25 that was over nine months and about 80 that uh, they had on board, but they say 25 over nine months because uh, the more experienced people are the ones closing the big deals. So that's often those who have more than nine months experience and they have the confidence to pitch. They know the product really well and they can get the shit done. They can close a deal on the government side, though. Let me see if I can find that net retention. What was the word that they used again? U.S. net dollar retention. So let's just Google retention. I mean, let's search for retention. Oh, there you go. Yeah, 146. Damn. Damn, you nailed it. <laughs> Yo, you have good memory. I mean, I know it was over 100%, but that's pretty good. 146. Yeah, you're right. So on the government side, I mean, this is uh, this is really good. And... You know, like this this statement, when when the results came out, right? Like when did it come out? Earnings release date? Uh, it was on the 17th. It was before all this, you know, unfortunate uh, events of, you know, Russia's invasion in Ukraine. But during all that time, I remember the American government was making a lot of noise like about the troop buildup and everything all around uh, Ukraine. And I remember this really stood out to me, like this sentence really stood out to me. And it said, our newest products from Edge AI and Meta Constellation to Gaia and Cosmos are being leveraged on the front lines of the near peer fight. So this was a big statement for me. You know, everybody was hoping what's happening today would never happen, but it did. But it just goes to show how like having data or knowledge or intel is everything so that's uh that, that was a big uh a big uh like a big takeaway for me from the accompanying remarks it's all it's 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 crazy how alex carp always is like able to profit i'm not gonna say prophesize like i'm not gonna uh paint him as a huge saint or something but his ability to have the company ready for any type of crisis, like either it was COVID and it was go time and they had the, the NHS in the UK and the equivalent in the US on board, ready, plugged in, and they were able to you know distribute all the vaccines, the PPE in a quick, efficient manner. It's a huge logistical nightmare. And the fact that Palantir was able to run that so quickly is, is a testament to management's ability to build critical modules critical products that can serve you know society and uh you know that's why i'm an investor in palantir because i know that it's not just a fluff software that uh, any startup can just you know try to do or try to emulate let me see your uh, comments here so uh i did that I'd be interested to see how fast commercial grows in Q1. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, how fast commercial grows, like, I'll be honest, man. Like, if you look at this, right, they did 48 to 100 to 200. And that was with the backdrop of six experience headcount with more than nine months and 25 experience headcount with more than nine months. We still have all of this headcount that's coming online. So I really think... The growth is going to be 
important uh to what extent i mean your guess is good as mine as the denominator gets bigger i mean it's hard to keep pulling out 100 percent gains year over year but with the volume of headcount us commercial headcount that's going to become experience i think that's going to be a game changer uh sales school i remember you know the reason why they keep talking about nine months i remember uh mentioning this to someone on twitter or one of my old videos is because you know these big software companies like erp software companies like sap they also focus you know they have this oops they have this uh nine month cutoff like the first year when you join sap for sales they send you to like a full-time program like a nine-month program where you're 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 learning and then year two and three they complement your learning skills so to sell an expensive license to, to sell an expensive product uh to convince the it departments who are usually you know engineers and you know they look at salespeople in a shady way uh you know you need to know what you're doing and uh you need to be able to show that this product can really create value and offer value to the IT team so they can focus on other projects that's critical to the business. And uh, especially these days with IT teams being stretched thin, the IT talent being stretched thin, um, I think with the bigger sales headcounts that they have, they're going to be able to land and make uh, connections and make deals but uh only time will tell you know that's why i'm always excited to see the quarterly financials i just need to get in the details and figure out what's going on and uh, you know that's what keeps me going like the daily stock price like that i mean that it, honestly it hurts it hurts anybody holding uh palantir shares but it's my conviction and you know my daily you know my research that makes me like let, lets me write it through you know that oracle guy i hope he will bring huge growth yeah i mean what was his name again uh linkedin uh, volunteer new hire europe i think it was uh executive i forgot his name i think it was like matthew something uh hire matthew uh yeah philip matthew there you go philip matthew and uh, you know what was what really stood out to me in this though was it was the first time I've ever seen them um, dedicate any PR to like the Middle East and Africa. Usually it was always just Europe, Western allies, Europe, Western allies. You know that was it. You would never ever hear Middle East and Africa because a lot of those countries are neutral. You know they're not really picking sides they're just trying to survive and do what they have to do so to hear that uh palantir is creating or hired someone and appointed him the head of middle east and africa too that's uh that's interesting but let's see you know it could just be a super expensive uh head count but obviously he has a lot of experience and i'm sure his compensation is tr tied to growth and uh the thing about these type of positions like i've seen it happen before i used to work at an international fashion company and they would create a new division saying okay well this is the international division and you know we're hiring the top dog you know we're going to pay someone a lot of money to get this going but their compensation their share growth uh, all of that was based on their growth of the division so these guys are super highly motivated to get uh, to build from the ground up and just keep it going to another level so that they can get paid well and, uh, you know, obviously feel some sense of success in what they're doing. So it's, uh, so let's see. I mean, let's see what happens with uh, Philip uh, Mathieu. Uh, I imagine this guy is bilingual. He's uh, definitely French English. I think he's based in Switzerland. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to see. Uh, going back to the accompanying remarks, I mean, was there anything else from here that really stood out to me that I think is worth touching on? Uh, I mean, yeah, the growth has been crazy. The cohort, I think they had a slide. No, it wasn't here. It was in the actual uh, presentation. But uh, in the actual presentation, they also talked about this, their ability to 
continue growing with existing customers like he touched on space force how they were able to grow from 100k to to uh, 20 20 million i believe and you kind of see that here right the u.s commercial revenue by cohort this information i find is super interesting because you can see that the cohort that exists like let's let's just say 2019 so it's like the grayish one uh it's this one right here is it yeah it's this one is it this one 2021 is that 2020 is these two 2019 is that yeah 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 exactly so if you look at the 2019 cohort you see that the acquire scale no acquire expand and scale module that they have like it works you know it's they're super sticky you could see it with the same cohort so that's the same group the same group is always going from 19 to 69 to 102 and then you see that again with the 2020 cohort they go from 6 to 18 they tripled that so this is all going to be, and look look at this number <laughs> this number is ridiculous it's 53 and it's only 2021 how is this going to expand how is this going to scale you know i'm excited to see all of that play out but uh, it really depends so, uh, I mean, look, the Morgan Stanley uh, call today, was there anything new, groundbreaking that I, you know, I that I didn't know before? Absolutely not. Uh, I did like the fact that they touched on Apollo because a lot of people don't talk about Apollo enough. And, uh, you know, I know there's some YouTubers, uh, you know, I know Chris, uh, code strap i've seen some guys who, who who've mentioned or talked about these things in various forums but i think it is a important uh, tool that's going to give palantir the flexibility because now it's all about data storage you know people know that in the internet can get cut off by an invading country uh unless like elon musk comes to save you that that you know you need to have access to your data you need to be able to control that data and if the data is in the cloud and then you're not able to access the cloud you're screwed so that's why sensitive data needs to there's governments now saying well you know this type of sensitive data needs to stay in europe or needs to stay in the uk and um and uh you know we're gonna we're gonna see we're gonna see how things go uh yeah load up the boat uh true man trust me man i've been loading up the boat for days i've been loading up the boat for days but uh it's also important to to be diversified because you know you don't know where markets go where things go so you know i try to stay diversified i do have an important holding in palantir but i also have important holdings in banking and real estate uh you know the the boring stuff but uh but yeah palantir is going to be the one that's going to that's going to take us to the promised land. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm one of the things uh, that I'm heavily invested in uh, in the last year. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll, uh, you know, everybody else is looking for a quick trade, a quick win. But for me, it's really uh, investing in a business that's highly valuable, that is differentiated, that is that has a lot of competitive advantages that other people don't. I think Palantir does have a lot of competitive advantages. The fact that they're so connected to the government, the fact that they sued the government, won, and then ended up landing major deals back to back, which means they've proven their ability to execute and they're super reliable. Uh, there's so much that I really appreciate about the Palantir management team. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a, uh, optimistic optimistic investor but uh yeah let's uh let uh, let's see where it takes us and uh you know i still have a lot to do like for the spacs man like there is so many things that are going on with the spacs i have to go and do all my research on the spacs i've done a few of them uh i don't know if you've seen them drew but uh i have done where was it like i've done all of these so I've done my deep dive on these companies and, you know, I, I really understand what they're doing and what they're up to, but there's so, there's just so many. I was kind of relieved to hear Sham say they hit the peak of SPAC investments because I can't do it, man. It's so hard to keep up. 
it's so hard to keep up but i'm uh i'm getting there you know i have to hit these companies i'm gonna do my research on them and then do my research on these ones and then these ones which are uh, a few have been confirmed like these ones are 100 percent confirmed uh because they, they they went public but uh but yeah Anyways, uh, I'm just I could keep uh, rambling on forever, man. But uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm not I don't want to bore you guys. So uh, this was my first live video. I really didn't plan anything. But uh... oh wait, Drew, you said uh, your allocation is twenty five to thirty percent. It's pretty good, man. I have like a a low six figure position, low to mid six figure position in Palantir. So like yeah yeah i'm about the same boat i would say yeah 10 20 percent yeah maybe but uh oh yeah lilium honestly man what can i say lilium is lilium has potential man it has so much potential and you know the fact is the fact the the thing that i love that i love the most is that it's not just a a picture on uh, Photoshop, you know, like I've watched, if you watch my Lilium video, I've looked at all the prototypes. Uh, I've seen them fly in the plane, you know, I've seen it and it, it's pretty cool that, you know, they actually have a product that works and I have to give props to the founder. He's like around my age or like, you know, early mid thirties. And he said like, yo, I was super naive when I got into this program. If I knew how hard it would be, I would have just given up but he just had the confidence at his age to just do it and he got the funding he got the backing he convinced a lot of people and now uh and uh and now look at it man it's uh it's 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 pretty cool it's pretty cool uh flex yeah 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 i don't like to talk about any i really don't like to disclose anything that i'm doing i i, I like to be low-key you know i just felt comfortable with you drew <laughs> <laughs> but uh but uh yeah so i mean look uh lilium i think look the truth is the biggest challenge for lilium and i know because i was in aviation i've seen how hard it is to get uh certification and to get a new uh program or a new uh, aircraft uh, certification especially after the 737 max drama it, it's hard it requires like a full you know, a full competent team of engineers, leaders, visionaries, uh, PR people to get all of this done. And, you know, Lilium's really getting into like uncharted territories in the sense that they're like, oh, we're going to do our, a special new type of aircraft and it's going to be used to taxi people in short distance. Like that's a big risk for the FAA, FAA to take because imagine if it... You know, imagine the 737 Max drama happens, you know, like just imagine, you know, I'm not trying to put this into the universe, but imagine you hear like these jets just going down or some stupid drone or, you know, people are just getting in the way of the jets and it's causing issues, you know, uh, you, God forbid, you know, something bad happens, it's going to kill the company overnight. You know, like Boeing was able to survive the 737 Max uh, drama because they're a huge company. They have a military division. They're able to keep things going. But for Lilium to go through the same type of pain and suffering that Boeing went through with the 737 Max, it's going to be like it would kill the company overnight. So uh, uh, I'm excited. A hundred percent. Like, look at these networks. Like, you know, they want to hit all these places. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good thing that they definitely have uh, Palantir. Palantir has that cash money. You know, they have that two billion cash. So hopefully they could. Uh, and and they have the backing of you know the former founder or not the founder, former CEO of Airbus. So these are highly connected people in the airline industry. So uh, I think if Lilium does have some setbacks, they'll be able to pivot and adjust. You know, let's take a step back and remember 
Lilium's a small aircraft, and if there's any issues, they'll probably be able to fix it really quickly. It's just going through the the cycle, the le regulatory cycle, to get it all updated, to get on, get back on the same page or in the good grace of the FAA. But it's not like a 737 Max where it's gonna you, it's a huge aircraft, and you have to go through so many things and diagnose all the issues. I'm sure the uh, the engineers behind Lilium know the plane like inside out. So if there's any issues, they'll be able to take care of it quickly. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, do I see myself... Do I see Lilium launching in Canada, though? I don't know. Like Canada, we do have... Yeah, maybe, yeah. The traffic is not as bad as it is in, in the US, like in LA. But like in Florida, you just have the population. The population is so much higher that it would justify, right? The business model. But, uh, but, uh, TBD. Wait, what do you mean, uh, FSD play? The true FSD play. Man, I'm such a loser. I don't know what, the, what you mean by that. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me uh, Google it. FSD, meaning. Ah, uh, yeah. Doesn't really help me. What do you mean by FSD? Cause it could mean oh, it can mean so many things. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I don't know. Like uh, this this could be huge, and you know, don't forget Lilium. I mean, they talked about NetJets yesterday. Uh, uh, that net, they want a big deal with NetJets, but they also want a big deal with uh, Azul. Oh, full self driving. Okay, yeah, yeah, I got you, I got you. Yeah, yeah, it's like. Uh, Tesla magic, Tesla magic. Yeah. Um, they also have a, like a billion dollar deal with a Brazilian company too. Right. Like, uh, with Azul, I had a note it somewhere here before. Yeah. Where was it? Yeah. Where was it? Air tax. Azul, Azul, Azul. Okay. I don't know if I have a document that I had it saved before. Maybe. But uh, they do have a, uh, yeah, oh yeah, it's right here. Yeah, they're $1 billion deal, or like a deal in the billions. But uh, yeah, $1 billion deal. So, I mean, look, they're convincing a lot of people about it. So I think Lilium is, you know, the reason why I felt a bit sketchy about Lilium was because I was like, oh man, they have so many regulatory roadblocks to climb and everybody's so anxious and conservative uh but you know because you don't want that you don't want planes to be crashing in people's backyard you don't want uh you know these horror stories to happen so i think people are going to be super slow and conservative so because of that i was like okay yeah lilium has ambitious plans but how quick are they going to get there are they going to run out of money before they get there so me being the uh conservative accounting uh, nerd I was just like, yeah, you know, I'm a bit, uh, a bit sketched out, but, but uh, it's totally worth the risk, a hundred percent. Uh, yeah, full self driving. I don't know. You know, people talk about full self driving, but like I've seen some crazy videos of people like in Teslas just falling asleep, and like you know, in Canada, especially where I'm from, like you can't even. I would never trust full self driving in my life because. A, you can't fix stupid, and there's a lot of stupid people on the road. And B, like there's so many construction cones where I live. Like there's so much construction projects. Like I can never feel confident that the algorithm would be smart enough to detect the ingenious ways people set up construction sites. It's never consistent. Sometimes it's a surprise. And I've seen some crazy videos on YouTube where people let the full self-driving do its thing and they would still be like holding the wheel but then suddenly like the lane just disappears because a construction zone is like starting in five meters and the car just didn't pick it up and it would have smashed right into a uh like a median or something you know that's cutting getting in the way but uh yeah i only have 6.5 shares you mean like six grand worth of shares or like 6.5? Like you have fractional shares because, yo, know, honestly, it's uh, six shares, 100 shares, 
10,000 shares doesn't matter, man. Uh, don't have that in the air. Yeah, that's true. That's true. What you have in the air is uh, pretty much what? Yeah, you have trained pilots in the air. You might have helicopters. You might have some clowns with some drones in the air. But apart from that, yeah, you're right. You, you don't have you don't have a lot of stupid in the air. You actually have a lot of competent people. But uh, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it, man. I honestly didn't think anybody. I'm actually uh, super appreciative that you're here. You know, it would have been weird if I was just talking to myself. I could definitely talk to myself for a while, but it's cool to be talking to somebody still. Uh, oh, literally 6.5 shares of Lilium. OK, no way. You know what I own? The thing with uh, Palantir is that they're like an ETF, you know, like a speculative ETF. I mean, like, look at the look at the stuff that they own. They own so like they own a pharma company, a car EV company. These guys still didn't come up with a car satellite company, satellite company, uh, EV toll or, you know, plane company, robotics company, pharma. I don't know. I don't know. This is a trucking company. We data company. But they, it's like, uh, when you buy Palantir, it's like you bought, it's like kind of like you bought an ETF in a speculative, in a disruptive industry. It's like a having shares in Palantir is like having shares in also a disruptive portfolio. And all of these can crash and burn, or they could do pretty well. TBD. Yeah, exactly. Like Tesla. I mean, do you, did you follow the Tesla story? Like, I remember, like, when I was in university, I remember uh, we had the valuation professor from, like, the state of uh, the New York State, uh, like New York School, State uh, Business School. Like, there's a big business school in uh, the New York State. Professor Damo Doran, okay? He's uh, Damo Doran. Uh, uh, yeah, as well. Yeah, so this guy is a... Uh, yeah, it's at NYU Stern. Okay, yeah, I'm not American, so I don't remember the names. But this guy is a, he's a big deal. You know, people consider him like a valuation guru. And at the time, it, when he came to my university to give a, a seminar, he was telling us like, yeah, you know, uh, he was telling us how cracked Tesla was. Like Tesla was, <laughs> he's like, for Tesla to be worth what it is today, and this was like, I would say 2012, He's like, for Tesla to be worth what it is today, it would need to sell their cars at Porsche margins. So they need to sell like Porsche premium car, premium margins with the with the volume of Toyota. And I remember back then, I'm like, damn, that's cracked. Like, I would never invest in Tesla because they're not doing that. They're not selling at margins of Porsche and they're definitely not selling volumes of uh, Toyota. But now, fast forward 10 years, I mean, no one would have guessed this, obviously, but fast forward 10 years now, Tesla's like worth more than all those car companies combined, right? It's, it's crazy. So, uh, so I mean, look, uh, we, could, uh, we could try to be, I could be like my little conservative, um, you know, uh, accountant uh, hater here and say, yeah, well, you know, uh, we just only make some million. How are they worth uh, this much? But it's possible that Weijo can just explode in five, six years. And uh, and I won't buy Weijo directly, but I own Weijo as a Palantir shareholder. So I'm okay with that. Oh, no way. You only got invested in 2020. Okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah. I started investing like back in the... I mean, no, yeah, 2020. I started investing like in 2012. So many ups and downs. So many episodes of trying to get rich quick. Uh, but I i mean, like the cannabis industry, for example, was one that was crazy. Uh, but uh, I've never really, never really done like a deep, dedicated dive as I've done for like Palantir. And the more and more I learn about it, the more I'm convinced that it's going to be a company that is going to be here for a while. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, well, they existed since 2012. The thing is, they've been going through product cycles and now they found like Foundry came out in 2018. 
so you know they're they're hitting their their groove now and uh and uh, let's see where it goes man let's see where it goes uh i wish i only got investing finally sundial dude don't even get me started, man. Sundial, there are so many bullshit stocks. I feel terrible. I've told people to buy, uh, like I've told people close to my family, like, oh yeah, buy this, buy that. It looks promising. I even went, I've traveled and went to, uh, you know, these production facilities the while they're being constructed, seeing things with my own eyes. And I was just like, yeah, this is it. This is the future because I'm in Canada. So that's where it was going to be legal. So I've been around and uh, I travel to conferences and all kinds. And uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of them have crashed and burned, man. It's, um, it's a terrible thing, but that's the risk you take uh, when you're investing. You know, everything can crash and burn overnight. And uh, all you need is incompetent, greedy people to who try to take shortcuts. That's why like management integrity, management's philosophy is so important uh, because they can literally drive the company to the ground. And uh, that's why uh, I really like the fact that, you know, Palantir's management team is very, they have like a philosophy and it's really like, it, it, it drives their, everything they do at Palantir, you know, like Alex Karp is very pro West, Western de uh, democracy very very pro america america needs to be the best uh in uh the it sector and r d and in, in new technologies so these are the people that have like an inert drive to do big things you know they're not just in it for the money uh obviously alex car made a killing this year but uh or last year with his options that he got in like 2011 and 2009 i think but uh but I think he uh, he 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 earned it, earned it in the sense that what? Where did he go from? He went from, what was it? He went from. I remember doing this before, but I have it somewhere. Where was it? Where was it? Where was it? He went from like he took the company's revenues from like sixteen million to like a billion in ten years, which is pretty uh pretty amazing oh yeah right here yeah so i built this chart uh and yeah so he got his options around 2009 and 2011 and at that time the company revenues were 72 million right and uh he pretty much grew it to 1.5 billion you know almost every year it was double digit growth and uh you know if they continue with their 30 percent growth then they're gonna hit 4.3 billion in uh, 2025. 4.3 billion uh, today. What's Palantir worth uh, just based on market cap? <clears throat> 23. So yeah, you know they're gonna be uh, they're gonna have a price to sales of uh, 23 or a forward price to sales like like 5.75. I mean. But you got to discount this. Obviously, I'm doing something super casual. Don't do this. But if we discount this back, uh, it's still uh, it's still speculative. It's still, uh, but it's it, it it it's it's interesting for management to guide thirty percent growth to twenty twenty five. That's solid. Like they know what they're doing. They're aiming for a crazy crazy growth. So uh, let's see what happens. But uh, but yeah. Check out Cresco Labs. Dude, the uh, cannabis industry. There was, uh, what was it? I think it was True Leave. It was Cresco Labs. Uh, well, there was another one that Canopy Growth invested in that was supposed to be like a, uh, a game changer. I forgot what it was called. Does anyone remember? Yeah, totally not. Totally not financial advice. <laughs> no. No, 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 never financial advice. Really, it's just, uh, you know, shooting the shit, you know, just talking casually, you know, nothing serious. You always have to make your own decisions. Like, I mean, I, and also, like, I never believed in that shit. You know what? One of the main reasons I started this YouTube channel 
was because I was so sick of seeing people just say anything and everything to justify their, uh, their, you know, shit coin or pump and dump stock that they were getting into. Like uh, it was crazy at one point. So I, I had friends, I had younger nephews, or, I mean, younger cousins losing money. And then I was like, okay, fuck this, you know, I'm going to start uh, doing this because, you know, some people need to get the truth out. You know, some people need to share the facts and let people make their own decisions. You know, if you want to gamble, gamble, but at least you can go to the casino, have fun, have a few drinks, you know, go out with your friends instead of sitting by yourself at home, fucking gambling on uh, a pump and dump, you know? Um... Uh, Okay, wait, what was it? Canopy growth. I mean, now I need to, now I need to check this out before I forget. Canopy growth, USA. God, they had a, uh, they had a deal to buy a company out if the US went uh, public. If the US, uh, if the U US legalized weed uh, or legalized cannabis, but uh, canopy growth, USA. acreage it was acreage it came back to me I, I i just started looking at all this shit it's not on the screen but it was acreage i'm pretty sure it was something something acreage yeah there you go acreage deal my god it's so funny how back in the day people were spending billions of dollars and giving themselves ridiculous valuations based on shares uh like paper you know fake paper and they were buying each other out with ridiculous valuations <laughs> so stupid <laughs> what a time to be alive anyways man yeah nice talking to you drew appreciate you man see you soon some of the u.s ones will be big question is which one i don't know man i don't know what's gonna happen with uh uh what's gonna happen with uh the u.s side I mean, you know what I really, you know what sucks because, oh, what, uh, re thoughts on the uh, call? Honestly, honestly, if you want, you can go back and listen to it. But A, there was no video. B, the sound was kind of weird. And C, there was nothing new, like nothing new at all. Nothing. So, uh, it was just, you know, I made sure to listen to it just in case, but uh they reiterated you know their software offerings how they're gonna go uh you know to the market mo with their modular uh with their modules uh i did like how shiam said we're gonna focus on selling to the it teams now and not so much the business whereas before it was they tried to sell to the business the business is like okay i'm down but you know like we need to talk to my it leader my vp in it and then that guy would say, go, go, you know, go F yourself. We No deal, you know? So Palantir is now saying, well, we're going to focus on the IT team first, get them on board, get them to sponsor us, and then the deals will come through. So that was cool. Uh, but yeah, 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 same talk, nothing new. It was always the same, uh, same banter, nothing new. Um, at least you, you, one thing, though, on tone, I did notice that Shyam's tone was uh, was low, was normal. You know, it was more like a normal dude, just like you and me, just taking it easy. It wasn't like super enthusiastic, super sales pitchy, like super, you know, gun ho on selling an idea. It was more relaxed. It was more low key. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I... I hundred percent like i'm sure morgan stanley has a reach uh yeah exactly no no you guys nailed it yeah exactly like morgan stanley does have that reach uh a lot and credibility and uh you know when that when the call ended you heard applause so i think there were people in the room and they were presenting like in in a conference setting uh but uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Like you know, people are understanding their businesses. People are hearing Shyam. I honestly think Shyam is a legendary, legendary public speaker. He does such a good job at 
communicating the ideas and what they're doing. But before he was a bit too extra, you know, he's throwing too much sauce into the pitch. But now he's uh, tamed it down. And uh, I think he did a great job at selling the company and letting people know. Like for me, though, it was nothing new. Like for me, I was just like, oh, same old shit, you know, but um, but that's how it is, right? When you invest in public companies, they're not going to be putting out new information technically without putting out a public uh, w without putting out a press release uh, because then it's not fair to existing shareholders. You know, this is not like your uh, startup firms that don't know what they're doing and the CEO is talking too much uh, uh, at some press conference. Oh no, don't say that. So what? You don't you're not a fan of Alex Carp? I mean Alex is cool. You know why? Maybe it's because I'm 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 more uh You know why clearly Alex Carp ha he like has a million thoughts going through his head. And sometimes it's like, I feel like it's pulling him in multiple directions before he addresses a point, but he's, he, 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 you could tell he's passionate, right? Like he's passionate about what he's doing, what he's talking about. But you remember the F bomb, like from the uh, Q4 earnings release, I was super surprised by how he just dropped the F bomb just like that and just like yeah yeah whatever you know like what's the worst that can happen you know and uh although it was like borderline borderline unprofessional or i would say it was unprofessional uh shareholders needed to understand like okay well that's the culture you know that alex carp has oh yeah totally I think all management does like even me like I think communicating clearly is such a big challenge and uh for people like Alex Carp absolutely like they need to get coached they need to know how to get straight to the point and then let people know okay well now I'm going to ramble on you know and uh I mean what was the, what was the thing that you remember the most from the earnings call that you felt like he didn't answer or he was like a bit all over the place like did a moment really stick out to you yeah 100 percent. and the fact that morgan stanley's talking about it it, it it might create like that echo right with other firms to start listening i mean i'm not sure if you guys look at this on a regular basis but uh I always, I haven't looked at it in a while because, you know, to be honest, I couldn't, I, I'm not like uh, super obsessed uh, about who's buying what because I don't really let it, uh, let it, uh, I don't really let it like dictate how I feel about Palantir. But if we look here, I mean, I used to do this before, like all the time. But if we look here, like we could see what's going on, right? Like all the new positions, they're the ones in green. Uh, I don't know if I can zoom in a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, so if we zoom here, if we go here, you could see which companies are investing in Palantir. Like this company, Norge Bank, increase. It's a new position, but they, because when it's green, it's new. Uh, they bought 14 million shares, you know? 14 million. Who casually just buys 14 million shares? Uh, I know I don't. Do you do any, know anybody who does that? So they bought 14 million shares and this was announced today. So 14 million shares with a value of 270 or $269 million. So that's big. That's big. And uh, let's see what else is going on. Any interesting activities? Yeah, Vanguard's all up in it, without a doubt. Uh, so we got some new... Oh, you see here, they opened up a short position. Small amount, 6,000 shares. Uh, fuck 
Um, what else is there? Vienna. Vienna Asset Management, new position, 45,000. 141,000. Black rock, small amounts, small amounts here and there. Okay, another one, almost 931. Uh, almost a million shares. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay. So that's what's been happening. Okay, that's cool. I mean, if we look at who owns the most, still the usuals, Vanguard with all their ETFs, BlackRock, again, Vanguard, State Street. Okay, see, this is the timing, right? Like, we know this is not true because ARK dipped completely. They're not involved. Morgan Stanley, 22 million shares. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, so... Yeah, so you see this Norge group? God damn. So they just opened up a position. Almost 15 million shares. Definitely like top 15. I mean, let's see what Norge Bank, Norge Bank is. Uh, would you say it's uh, Norway? Would you say it's Norway? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I knew it. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I didn't even look at it. I knew before I said it. If I had to guess, it would be Norway. But uh, yeah, that's pretty dope. So... Uh, so yeah, I mean, look, uh, maybe uh, the, the 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 Norway uh, folks uh, were like, oh god damn, you know, Meta Constellation is uh, so useful. Who 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 invented Meta Constellation? And they're like, oh, it's Palantir. And they're like, oh shit, okay, buy the shares. Somebody buy the shares. But uh, you know, this is the type of uh, daydreams I have, you know. But who knows what happened. <laughs> Reality could have been anything, but uh, but yeah. Anyways, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is nine o'clock, nine p.m. Eastern time in Montreal, Canada. So I'm going to head out. I'm gonna go eat, and then go back to work. But I'm so happy I actually did this. Uh, got a chance to chat with some of you. So I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you. Rui, Day, Defini, Arod, Chris, and uh, Drew. Those are the people I were talking to. Oh, and Joe. My bad, Joe. Uh, yeah. So, uh, thank you so much, guys. I'll see you on the, the next video. You know, obviously, I'm putting out different types of content. You know, I like talking about Palantir. I like talking about debt, banking, mortgages, all this and that. So, if you guys see me put out videos about different topics, feel free to check it out. Leave me a comment. Maybe it could be relevant to you or maybe not. But if you have any topics that you want me to talk about or any other shares you want me to look into, uh, don't hesitate. You know, I heard Amazon's doing a split 20 to 1 uh, eventually. So I'm going to I'm gonna talk about that because I feel like people are going to be like, oh, Amazon 20 to 1, oh, it's going to go to the moon. But in theory, it shouldn't. Would there be more demand for a stock? Maybe, but it's going to be offset by the supply of new shares. So I, I don't see how prices are going to go skyrocket. You know, uh, people are people buying into that is like they're trying to play into the retail sentiment and leave people holding bags, in my opinion. But man, that's just me. But anyways, talk to you guys soon. Take care. Hey, from Portugal. Nice, man. All right. See you later, guys. Have a good night. Ciao.